When is a model steam engine not worth rebuilding? Part 5. After working on this engine for quite a while, there are still a lot of jobs to do to make it work. I would not normally use aluminium pistons, but this engine is for a collection and just for show. A lot of the time I seem to resurrect badly made engines. So when I look at an engine, if it's badly made, I have to say, this is badly made. But then some people write in and say, oh, well, that's a bit unkind for the person who built it. And yes, I agree it is. My first attempts at steam engine building were not so good either, but I just used to continue making the parts repeatedly until I got them right. One problem for me is most of these collectors that I come across don't have a clue as far as steam engines are concerned. They just like the way they look. A lot of the steam engines I seem to work on have just been tarted up to sell online, and they're not very good. Hence the title of this video, When is a model steam engine not worth rebuilding? And this is a perfect subject for the video, because it really isn't worth the amount of effort I'm having to put into it to resurrect it from its previous state. It's time now to look at the fixings. These are some 2BA studs that I made which are going to hold the cylinders onto the upright standards. And if you've been watching this video series from the beginning, you will remember that the cylinders were held onto the upright standards by some simple slotted bolts, one of which was damaged. So I'm going to use studs, it's a much better idea. The studs will locate securely in the standard, and then I can just put nuts on from underneath, far easier. This is the way I would normally fit a stud to an engine, by using a pair of lock nuts. First of all I make the studs all to the same length, and then I do a test fit to see how far they actually go down into the cylinder, and once I know, I make a spacer, this is just a piece of hexagon brass bar with a hole drilled through the middle, and by lock nutting a pair of nuts onto the actual stud, it can be securely bolted in place. But I always use Loctite 603 to hold it in place, because it's very annoying when you take a nut off a stud and the whole stud comes out of the casting. Loctite 603 has got many and varied uses in the workshop, and I really do put it to good use. But one word of caution, do not use too much. It will stick anything to anything, and the worst thing about it is that it removes paint. This engine is a bits and pieces engine, so the cylinders were not originally on these standards, which is apparent when you look at them. You will notice there are many holes drilled all over the place and some of them go straight through the cylinder flange, they're not threaded. So I'm not going to use these, I'm just going to use the ones that are threaded, which gives me five fixing points, which is not brilliant, but it should be fine. There's plenty of surface area for the gasket, so we shouldn't get any leaks here. Fixing these studs is a very repetitive process, so once again I will speed up the video. Then repeat the entire process for the other cylinder. Remove the cylinder, fit the studs, and put the cylinder back on the upright standard, and yes, everything fits fine. Over now to the flywheel. This is a flywheel that I turned up a while back. This flywheel fits the crankshaft okay, the original flywheel was a rattle fit with a very strange key. So I'm now going to make a proper key to key this flywheel to the crankshaft. And now I'm going to spin the flywheel to see how the crankshaft feels in the main bearings. The crankshaft is very well made. I initially thought that it was machined from the solid, but when I removed all the grime from the crankshaft, I could see that it wasn't. It's actually built up, but it's built up, silver soldered, and then machined. Unlike the workmanship on many other parts of this engine, I cannot fault this crankshaft. It is really well made, and it spins very smoothly in the main bearings. Removing the key is a simple job. Here I'm using a sharp pointed screwdriver just to get behind the key to lever it out. Alternatively, as the key goes all the way through the flywheel, it can be tapped out from behind. And to finish off for the moment, here I am once again painting the front of the flywheel. This is Humbrol number 19, I believe, Humbrol Red, and I'm using quite a lot of it. As I'm now going to fit the piston rod and crosshead into one of the standards, I do need to remove the piston. This is what I'm doing at the moment. I've undone the nut, and then the piston itself is also threaded onto the piston rod. 
always put the gland onto the piston rod before wrapping the piston rod in graphited yarn. This graphited yarn is some old stuff that I have that I've unpicked from a much larger piece of graphited yarn. I do find the current graphited yarn that's been supplied is not so good, so I use this old stuff and it definitely does the job. It's not quite as graphited as it should be because it's unpicked from a much larger piece. What I would normally do is once I've wrapped the graphited yarn around the piston rod, I would apply some steam oil. This serves two purposes. One, it holds the graphited yarn to the piston rod, allowing easy insertion into the cylinder, and two, it gives a head start on the lubrication. It's good to have lubrication for the first run. And it's also good to be able to wrap the graphited yarn around the piston rod when it's in this state. It's much more difficult, as you can see here, if it's fitted inside the crosshead guides. When fitting a piston rod into a gland, make sure that the graphited yarn is nowhere near the thread on the end of the piston rod, otherwise it will be shredded by the sharp threads and will not seal properly. Do not over tighten the gland nuts. If you over tighten the gland, you're going to have a problem and you will probably score the piston rod, so be careful here. So it's time to do a dummy run on assembly of one of the connecting rods. So I'm poking the connecting rod into the crosshead, and then I fit the pin as you see here. This does not have the split pin in the other side, it's just pushed through to test. And now I'm going to look at the bottom end of the engine to look in detail at the way the big ends fit. On this engine generally, there are a few engineering disaster areas, and the big ends were one of these disaster areas. The big end bearing caps were originally held on, by just a couple of slotted machine screws. This is no good at all. What I'm going to do is fit studs and lock nuts because it would be pretty disastrous if the big end came loose when the engine was running. Don't forget this is quite a big engine, two two inch bore cylinders, and with 80 pounds per square inch behind these cylinders, that's some power, and a big end dropping off at the wrong time would cause serious damage if not total destruction to parts of the engine. Temporarily I'm using a couple of 2BA bolts to hold the bottom bearing in place. What I do notice is there is a large gap between the bottom bearing and the top bearing. Time now to fit the piston onto the piston rod. This is just the reverse of disassembly, so it's straightforward. What I'm having to do is solidly hold in place the crosshead so it can't move, and then this will allow me to tighten down the piston onto the rod using a pair of circlip pliers. Then the nut in the middle is simply a lock nut, and this ensures that the piston can never come loose. Time to see if the cylinder fits on top of the piston. First thing to do is clean out the cylinder, because that is also full of dust and grime, and then thoroughly lubricate the metal parts. These cylinders were originally put in a bath of cellulose thinners, so as far as grease is concerned, they are squeaky clean, not greasy at all. So now some lubrication is required to make sure that you do not prematurely wear out the piston rings. The final job with the piston rods and pistons is to do a slideability test to make sure nothing's binding as the crossheads go up and down in the crosshead guides. One final little job and a handy tip is to do with the slide valves. This is a small brass part that screws onto the valve spindle and it allows adjustment of the valve and it also moves the valve up and down. So I had to make one, a very simple job, machine a piece of brass, drill a hole in it, tap it 2BA, cut it to size and shape it. This will do the trick. These brass parts must not be a tight fit in the valve. If they're a tight fit, they're likely to hold the valve off the port face. Here's a useful tip. Slide valves in a vertical plane sometimes do not slam onto the port face when steam or air is admitted. So what I do is give them a bit of a helping hand. I use a piece of silicone rubber like you can see here. What this effectively does is holds the valve against the port face. I would only do this in a collector's stationary engine though, not in every engine. Particularly on a locomotive it would not be desirable. Unless the locomotive was fitted with a snifting valve, which is a vacuum relief valve, it is advantageous for the valve to fall off the port face to stop the cylinder from vacuuming. But with a collector's engine, which is going to be largely run on compressed air and usually nowhere near the real pressure required, it is impossible to get the valves to slam back on the port face. So just for convenience, this is a good idea. 
Normally, I would machine the valve or machine the brass part and recess this into the brass part or the valve. To hold the piece of silicone rubber tubing in place, I just used a dab of superglue. And that is it for this episode. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.